So welcome everyone to Kindred. This is Lisa Reagan and I am here with two women who are responsible for helping me to get on my path, my mother of a quest, as I've called it for the last 26 years. And I am so grateful to both of you. Thank you so much for coming in and talking um, about the new edition of the classic book, Attached at the Heart. And we are going to start with the opening to that book and how you have uh, you know, I'll just say, first of all, things have changed in all these years, and we're going to go over that. We're going to go over why there's a need for a third edition. We have new parents coming online who, of course, I didn't, I didn't ask questions until I was the parent. I didn't know the questions to ask until I was in it. So we know we have um, questions uh, from new parents and we also have new issues that none of us faced, especially with screen time, technology, and the de-evolution of any support for mothers and families in America. So this book is uh, incredible. I recommend it to everyone and everyone I know who is pregnant, I buy one and send one over to them because it is the very best parenting book there is out there right now. Mm -hmm. um, so let's start off with the opening to the book, which is a parent's call to arms. And in this parent's call to arms, you set the stage for what's really going on here in America, which is uh, pretty awful right now, but you also say that there is hope for the future. So that's, um, I'd like to hear how we, how are we going to do this, uh, both prepare uh, for parenting in this culture that is so anti-nurturing while holding hope? And let's start with Barbara. Well, thank you, Lisa, for having us. We're really excited to um, share our thoughts with Kindred Media because we just feel like this third edition is packed with a lot of information that I think will give parents a lot of reassurance that if they listen to their instincts, they're, they're what their heart is telling them to do, it goes along perfectly with the science. So our call to arms kind of has a different meaning than the typical call to arms. You know, we're thinking about the arms of embrace, the arms of holding, the arms of love. And a lot of people do think of attachment parenting or as we call ourselves uh, currently nurturings.org our primary um, strategies seem to be you know holding your baby a lot keeping them in a front pack you know keeping them nearby and safe and protected and so many parents are confused about that simple strategy because our society just wants us to, to separate, to, you know, incur independence, even in a newborn, and to <clears throat> um, instill in them this sense of, of independence, which, of course, we're all about, you know, wanting our children to have an autonomous life when it's developmentally appropriate. But how does that happen? It is through those first context, early weeks and months of nurturing, uh, feeding when the baby's hungry, you know, just that simple attunement. So when we look at the big picture, sometimes it is overwhelming, especially if there's, you know, if it's a single parent or parents who are both working, they're really um, desperately trying to figure out how am I going to raise a child when I can't get enough uh, leave of absence from work? or support from my, um, even my family, even my extended family, if they live far away from family. So, you know, Lisa and I were in that boat when we were young mothers. We had both moved to a state where we had no family. And fortunately, we were able to meet through La Leche League. So we're hoping that a lot of parents will read our book and start really getting creative in their thinking. Think, think maybe outside the box a little bit. How can I um, develop a nurturing environment for my baby and myself? I mean, we're all about nurturing the parents. That's really what uh, gave us the impetus to start 
our organization was knowing that parents desperately need support themselves. They can't possibly parent without, you know, connection from other adults in their lives. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. And I know Lisa might want to add to what I was saying. I was just going to say that uh, as an added dimension or perspective on a parent's call to arms is that it is truly a wake up call. You know, we are calling on parents to wake up to what's being done and not being done uh, for parents and for our children um, in that call to arms, we cited how uh, how much mental illness or mental health is, has degraded over time and how children are being medicated more and more. I mean, even very young children. Um, so it's, it's really a crisis situation. And we see and hear about uh, our young teen children having mental health issues so so young anxiety depression parents mothers having depression and while we don't want to be too simplistic there's definitely things that we can do that don't cost money you know lisa you hit the nail on the head about not knowing what questions to ask you know we don't know what we don't know and we don't know what questions to ask and you have to ask yourself well, why is that why isn't this wisdom being imparted onto younger generations so that but by the same token you know i think we're also changing the paradigm of the way that we parent our children or the way we treat them the way we see them we we are in um you know a transition period when it comes to our children and so in in one way maybe that was necessary so that we could wake up and say hey you know we're not going to take this anymore and you know what's wrong with this picture start asking questions so i think our whole the whole premise of our book was to as i often say empower parents and to give them the information that they need to make informed decisions and you know how simple it is as barb was saying just holding your child um just you know being allowed to love your child to fall in love with your child so many mothers don't feel if they feel like that's a luxury well i gotta go back to work you know I can't get too attached to my child because I have to go back to work. And that's the opposite of what that baby needs, right? And so, you know, as we go through the book, we're talking, um, you know, we talk about where attachment theory fits into this. And then we go through what we call the eight principles of parenting. And we go, we dive deeply into each one of those principles. And we, we say that these are, um, guideposts, not standards of perfection. Um, you know, we try to meet parents where they are. You know, it's it's so much more than parenting. It's about um, ra really raising our consciousness, and um, you know, it's about personal growth as well. So it's not about well, if my child does this. You know, how do I respond, or what do I do? But it's really you know, we're encouraging parents to really get to know their child as a human being, you know, as a spiritual being even, um, and just to learn to listen to what their children are trying to communicate to them. All those questions that we did not know to ask. Uh, and that's and why we wrote the book, because we didn't know. Good. You know? That's good. We learned I, the hard way. <laughs> This is the value of this book. And uh, I think Alanis Morissette wrote a wonderful endorsement for it about that. If you just listen to, to the wisdom in this book and apply it, this is this is it. This is going to change everything. And it was hard won uh, by both of you uh, in the beginning, because as you said, you, you had to become a parent before you even knew that world existed and to think that way and then to realize, oh, gosh, 
all of my sentimental ideologies around being a mom. I'm going to be a mom now and how, how, what a lightweight job that's going to be. And <laughs> so, no, that could not be more uh, untrue. So yeah, if, we both have degrees in education. We thought, oh, we've got this. How hard could it be? <laughs> yeah. I remember those days of thinking, all we have to do is get the word out. And I had no idea about things like uh, worldview and programming and culture or culture or influence and culture bias. Uh, and the fact that we're just not set up culturally, as you have said, to support parents. Other countries are, um, and they don't have a lot of the same issues uh, that we have. In fact, I know that, that both of you and Darsha Narvaez uh, will teach classes around the country about the Evolved Nest and attachment parenting. And she has said many times they have asked her, like, why is this a big deal? Why are you even talking about? Of course, you're going to pick up the baby. Of course, you're going to, what, why, is this something you really have to teach people? So it is, in some ways, uniquely a Western culture issue, but also uh, specifically American. Um, the anti-nurturing sentiments. Um, and I'll just mention, uh, since I brought up Darsha's name, she wrote the foreword to the book and she talks in the foreword about uh, parents being in this anti-nurturing culture. And you do address that in your book and how to respond. Maybe we should just uh, talk a little bit about some of the amazing practical uh, suggestions and wisdom in there for that. How do you navigate? Lisa. Yeah, it's one thing, one thing to, you know, to learn about attachment theory, um, but it's quite another to, to apply it to daily life. And even attachment theorists can agree, you know, is this, is attachment parenting really all that important or does it have anything to do with, with attachment? Well, of course it does. You can't just, you know, throw out, you know, theories and, and, and research and then not, well, how do I deal with this? You know, my baby's crying, you know, and my mother-in-law is telling me don't pick up the baby because I'm going to spoil it. And, or my friends are saying, you just need to put your baby in daycare or let them cry it out. They'll learn how to self-soothe. So they don't really understand the the cultural milieu out there, you know, that is really um, the, or the, what do you call the headwinds of, of parenting, you know, that what they have to uh, navigate through. And um, it's, it's really challenging. And then there are thousands of parenting books out there. And, you know, people, when you have a baby shower, people give you a book and they say, oh, this is the best book I've ever read. And then you learn that it doesn't, um, you know, doesn't um, agree with your intuition or your heart or what you knew. And so then you throw that out and, you know, you look for the next book. And, um, and you know, one thing we found was that so many books um, are not research informed, but rather based on ideology or um, uh, myths, you know, parenting myths that are passed down from generation to generation. And, and so that's, those are some of the things that we, we address in our book, you know, like where did, you know, uh, don't pick up the baby because you'll spoil it come from, um, only to find out it was from John B. Watson, the father of behaviors, behaviorism, you know, a man who never raised any actual children, but rather just wrote books about his, you know, his research. He was at Johns Hopkins and and we know now that that didn't work for his family because his granddaughter, actress Marriott Hartley, wrote a book about it. You know, the damage that he has done to society just from that one little, you know, adage, you know, that he came up with. Um, so, you know, it's it's crazy how, how it's become so much a part of the culture that, you know, you can ask any you know, middle schooler or high schooler, you know, to finish that sentence, don't pick up the baby because, and they, they know it, they've just kind of picked it up out of the, out of the ether or they've heard it, you know, from, 
people in their family. So there's so much that we're trying to change and um, and to to clarify for parents. Barbara, you want to add? Yeah, well, I just wanted to say that was one of the key points that we we're talking about in the new edition of our book is the science of resilience. You know, that this mythology that, you know, if you pick them up, you'll spoil them. And well, what kind of damage does that do to the brain of a baby who's crying and crying and unconsoled? Well, they're getting a, a bath of cortisol, which we know is very damaging to the brain, especially if it's if it goes on for a long time. And that's what happens with um, soldiers that have PTSD. They've had so much cortisol in their brain <clears throat> that it wires the brain differently. So you've got an infant whose brain is only 25% developed at birth, and we're t giving them this toxic overload of cortisol. So that to me is what's so exciting about the research is that it all confirms what our instincts tell us to do. You know, very few of us can listen to a crying baby. We have to go, you know, to the other part of the house, put earplugs in, just deny our own feelings, thinking that this is the right thing to do because of what we're told by even our pediatricians might suggest putting the baby on a rigid schedule. So some of the books that were very um, adamant about this in the past, the American Academy of Pediatrics actually came out and said, this is causing failure to thrive. You have to listen to your baby's um, cries, especially knowing that they're hungry, they have so many needs and those those early weeks and months. <clears throat> so uh, finding the correct sources, like Lisa was saying, you know, you're given a parenting book and you wonder if this is, you know, my, well, my friend loves this book, so it must be really great. Well, look at the resources in the back of the book. Look at the um, child development, you know, <laughs> research that's, incorporated into the book and if you're not finding anything but the author's opinion then that's a big red flag and we were really trying to you know give each each of our eight principles is backed up by uh wonderful science from all over the world i had the exact scenario that you just described happened to me as a young mother and i cannot remember the name of that book but it was yanked because it, did, it was causing failure to thrive. And I remember uh, re somebody who was a doctor <laughs> gave it to me and uh, going through it and looking for the magical part. I'm going to get to the magical part. Oh, the magical part is you just let them cry it out and you ignore them. I mean, really what is buried in this little book in the middle. And I remember being devastated because I thought, I can't do that. That This is the answer. Um, so for me, uh, going to uh, Families for Conscious Living, our original groups and attachment parenting groups, these were my life rafts as a mother because I got validation from my heart. And mm -hmm. what I have told everyone about uh, Darsha's work with the Evolved Nest and certainly attachment parenting is when my son was born, I saw a whole perfect being. And I instinctively knew my job is to keep him that way. <laughs> Let's keep him that way. And I knew I had a role in not shutting down my heart and how much I loved him and, and making sure that this, this is about keeping him healthy and whole. But going out into the world, finding out that uh, there's all these different factions and issues you have to choose from. And then uh, it, it's still like that uh, for parents. So it was difficult to figure out because all of the pieces of my child were broken up into different areas of science. And then uh, especially Darsha has come along and done this transdisciplinary work of pulling together the evolved nest, which is this lens that I saw my child through to begin with anyway, the lens of love. He's whole. He's a whole perfect being. How do I keep him this way? And she has 
has shown that academically. And then when I talked to her about attachment parenting and specifically your book, she did write the forward to it again. She says, yeah, well, this is the, how it's, you know, the, the and you've said this, Barbara, this is the applied uh, evolved nest. So how do you actually do it? You know, she says, here are the things to do. And your book takes us there. And this is how it's done. And the, and the eight principles, it's a beautiful thing. So, so many parents I see coming on calls for the last 26 years and in groups have the same question I have in there. And it's always kind of quietly whispered, like, you know, just don't feel like that's quite the right thing to do because you're afraid of all the cultural backlash if you say too loud that you just want to love your child and keep them healthy. Oh, that's right. Well, I like I love what you said about focusing on the heart. And we do talk about some techniques that parents can use, you know, when they're having stress from, you know, confusion about, you know, well, my mother says this and my mother-in-law says this and the baby's having a meltdown. And what do I do to, you know, calm myself? Because that's the other thing we talk about is that we are the emotional regulator for our baby. So doing a simple practice like what uh, is called heart-focused breathing, we talk about this quite a bit in the book, just breathing, you know, sending your baby love, but you are deeply breathing, you are getting yourself calm so that you can, in a calm way, uh, be that emotional regulator for your child. So that's another huge mythology that's going along with what Lisa just said about you know, the myths that we're being handed down from generation to generation um, don't have anything to do with, with science. And I loved what you said, Lisa, about looking at your baby as whole and perfect as they are. And we have been indoctrinated to believe that babies are born with sin or perhaps they have a natural inclination towards evil. You know, so those are the things that change the lens in which we see our children. But I, we must look at our babies as a gift, as perfect and whole and good, you know, so that we and, and we hope and strive to to keep their spirit alive and to keep their natural their inclinations for goodness and empathy um, nurtured and cultivated. And how many times have we heard the baby's manipulating you? Like they have an adult brain with this capacity to, you know, you know behaviorism again, right? Yeah. Or, or um, an inborn need to, you know, manipulate others to, you know, get their needs met that, and not think about the, the adult's needs as if they have a capacity to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hilarious when you think about it, but we're, that's a common thing you hear. And Darsha yeah. would say that's the authoritarian brain that's starved for nurturing. Exactly. You know, into that defensive protective mode and now projects all this control issues. I got to control this baby. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the cycle goes round and round. Oh, so, you know, I feel like something happened, though, after quarantine. We were all uh, inside, a lot of people home with their babies and children for the first time. And I started to read these amazing features in mainstream media outlets like the New York Times on mo motherhood and telling the truth about motherhood. And how mothers needed to have support and we don't have paid leave in this country and everybody else uh, seems to be able to have that and maternity leave and we have horrifically high, of course, uh, maternal and infant mortality rates. But the other statistic, and I'll just tell our listeners to brace yourself if you haven't heard this one, is that um, new mothers in the first year, the leading cause of death is suicide. And depends upon which one uh, study you're looking at. Some it's one of the leading causes and for others, it is the leading cause. And I will put uh, resources underneath uh, wherever you find this uh, interview uh, for that. So you can see Darsha's response to that about aloe mothers. We were never meant to do it alone. Also, we do have a national hotline uh, 988 
that anyone can call at any time if they feel uh, like they need help. So uh, the seriousness of uh, motherhood, I feel like you and I, because of the orientation of trying to normalize nurturing, have understood this uphill battle, but it seemed like it just caught the attention of a lot of people during quarantine. And then there was a, I feel like a, um, a, t a tidal shift of, we want to be home with our children happening. And now we have a lot of people who work from home and there's a big uh, call right now. I think it may have even passed for a 32 hour work week. Um, so uh, this uh, change seems like for people who are now thinking in this direction of how do I get this? Maybe where do I get validation for again, feeling like I should be with my baby. I, I would like to be with my children. Uh, this book is going to validate that this and give guidance on the direction we need to go. Again, 70 years of science are packed into it. Um, and then your amazing and beautiful 30 years of wisdom and experience and training and working with parents. So there, I feel like there's a little silver lining because there's interest. Is that, do you feel like that is happening too? Well, there's certainly interest more overseas than there has been in the UN, United States, unfortunately. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that did make me hopeful that maybe women started to realize how important they were in their child's life. And, and then realizing, hey, you know, how come we don't have paid maternity leave? Why don't why doesn't our government, why don't corporations value us as mothers and as in, in families? You know, it's too many parents have to decide whether to work or be home with their sick child or lose, you know, or lose their job if they don't go to work. These are just impossible challenges. No wonder our, our culture is so toxic. Um, and Barbara, maybe you want to say something about the hardwire to connect um, report, but that came out what twenty three years ago. Uh, we went to a conference with these findings, and it was really shocking about um, the st standards of daycare, for instance, around the country, <clears throat> and we're so far we still are so far from a reasonable you know caregiver ratio you know it's still the standard is four babies to one caregiver yet if a mother has quadruplets the whole community comes to her aid but yet a stranger taking care of four babies she doesn't get you know mostly, okay. mostly young women and a very high turnover so you know, often the conversation politically around supporting mothers is giving them free daycare versus how much more cost saving would it be and how much better for the mother and baby if she if her income was supplemented so that she could stay home rather than always finding a solution that's outside of that mother baby, you know, relationship. So that's where I think we really need to get the science behind political movers and shakers that genuinely have an interest in supporting mothers, but don't really have the science behind them. So just like anything else, if we want changes in childbirth, if we want changes in um, policies, it has to come from the grassroots. So <clears throat> finding new political voices that understand these issues would really help change the paradigm. But until it's then, only been <laughs> sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say until then, you know, I think our, we try to serve our young parents that are coming to us right now by saying, you know, let's talk about creativity. What are some things that you might be able to do to stay home a little bit longer? Or, you know, maybe it means moving in with your parents for a while or finding, a, a if it's a single mother, finding another single mother to move in with and you two 
share, like, I love what you said about aloe mothering. That term, you know, is kind of new to a lot of parents. What is aloe mothering, aloe parenting? Those are the the aunties and uncles and grandparents that are have been traditionally other caregivers in a baby's life. Bruce Perry, one of our advisory board members, is an expert in child trauma. And he says it's only in the last, you know, 100 years or so that our paradigm has changed from all babies being born into an environment where there were four adults in their lives. Minimum. At least. At least four. So when we've moved out of the village into big cities, away from our extended family, that has really created trauma, not only for the babies, but for the parents. They need the other adults who are invested in their baby as much as they are. So we have to create it somehow. We have to be very conscious about creating extended family for ourselves. Kathy Myers, who's been around as long as we have, if not longer, uh, has the Family at Home and Network uh, organization, and she is advocating for if we're going to pay for daycare and child care, why don't we just pay parents to stay home with their children <laughs> or make that possible financially uh, so that can be done. It's done in other countries. Um, you know, here I think the average is, what, 10 days uh, off that mothers have, and then they go back to work in other countries. They can have as uh, much as 18 months or more. Um, I think somebody, uh, one of the people who attend our calls is in Germany. I think they get three years. Um, wow. so, yeah, it can be done. Can be. Can be. I mean, just look at the math. Don't look at anything else. What would be more cost effective? Especially when you have such a high turnover, you're going to have to pay daycare workers a great wage and give them a better ratio of children. And ideally those caregivers would move up with the children. You know, a lot of them get very bonded to babies up to six months and then that baby goes to another class. Oh, yeah. That's why there's such a huge turnover. I really, you know, my heart goes out to care workers who are in that occupation because they love children, but yet it's, it's devastating for them. Suzanne Zedike's work, uh, she writes for Kindred, and she talks about uh, children experience turnover of teachers and daycare like a death, uh, because they do get, become attached uh, to their teachers and caregivers. So. Yeah, I, I want to say this was, again, late 90s, early 2000s, the Carnegie Foundation did a study on daycare specifically, and they said 80% of daycares were substandard. And, you know, I don't think that it's changed all that much since then. Um, so it's, it's more than, you know, this is a very complicated issue, you know, that is more than just ha ha paying for daycare. We need quality, high quality daycare or child care uh, with people who are paid well, who are educated, knowledgeable, committed, to being with that child um, because not everyone is going to want to stay home. You know, uh, you know, you'll have mothers who just maybe they didn't have a nurturing childhood or, you know, maybe they just don't have it in them to, to, to feel like they're the best one to nurture. Um, and so there need to be other options if say um, a family member is not available to take care of them. I mean, ideally, the best care would be a nanny, au pair, whatever, to come into your home and be become extended family if a family can afford that and to stay with that child until they're, you know, off to school. Um, but that is creating an, an allo parent situation in your in your home, if if possible. I think it was uh, Richard Bowlby. Now, he's the son of Dr. John Bowlby, considered the father of attachment, peer, uh, attachment theory. And he was saying <clears throat> that he wondered if his father's experience with the nanny didn't wasn't the um, 
you know, the springboard to his research in attachment. Because when he was four, you know, back then in England, the nannies did all the child care. And he had the same nanny for four years, and then she just abruptly left. And he just, it really devastated him as a four-year-old. Um, but we see, you know, that constant turnover of caregivers all the time. And we think, you know, oh, kids are resilient. They'll get used to it. But it really does damage to their psyche and their emotional health and well-being. One of the nature and nurture books out there, I remember reading the opening by the author, and she said when her mother saw her becoming too attached to her nanny, she'd just get a new one. She didn't want that. Oh. It's right here on my shelf somewhere. I just haven't put my hands on that in a long time. That was when I closed. <laughs> Maybe there was good stuff in there, but I, I couldn't take that. So, so tell me, uh, this is uh, the third edition. What is it you want people to know about Attached to the Heart that's new? And I'll start with Barbara. Well, um, one of the things, it's a new term that Dr. James McKenna, he's like the premier researcher in Mother Baby Sleep. Helen Ball, another researcher in, in England, uh, coined the term breast sleeping. And so I think this is an important concept for, for young parents to understand that sharing sleep with your breastfeeding baby is really a wonderful way to um, stay in attunement with the baby, have the baby close by for feeding on demand whenever you know they need to be fed. And it's a protective mechanism for babies, especially if they're prone to a sleep apnea, problems like that. So we're all about creating a very safe sleep environment, which means no fluffy bedding, no fluffy pillows, um, ideally having the bed maybe like a futon on the floor when you've got an infant. Another option is to have like a, a sidecar, the crib up to the bed on the same level as the mattress and make that a safe um, sleep environment for the baby that the mother has access to the baby. So their, their point is that a breastfeeding mother is in a different dynamic, in a different uh, state of sleep. Their REM sleep kind of matches the babies. They get into the same sleep cycles. It's fascinating research and very protective. Now, bottle feeding mother, she could have the baby very close by, not in the bed, but also in a, a, a sidecar situation. So she has a bottle available to feed the baby and, and practice um, a very nurturing sleep environment also. So I think there's so much misunderstanding about what is safe for a baby at night. And they're talking about, you know, a lot of the behaviors that we are encouraged to do, like have the baby sleep on their back, give them a pacifier, um, you know, have a sleep safe environment is exactly what we're talking about. Because really, when a baby's nursing at night, they are facing up, they are getting their sucking needs met. And then the mother, especially if um, her partner is not thrilled about having the baby in bed, well, then have the baby in a sidecar situation. But this term breast sleeping, I think, is needed to give parents guidelines on safe co-sleeping at night, being in close proximity at night. Even the American Academy of Pediatrics wants the baby in the room for the first year. They know that that's protective of sudden infant death syndrome. So they want the mother, the caregiver, to be in attunement with that baby at night. So having the baby within arm's reach is really um, critically important. So that was one, one thing that we... <laughs> I just say something about the breast sleeping word. I remember when James McKenna came out with that press release and we're trying to get it all over Kindred and get it out there because it was a beautiful thing. The description of what they found, uh, what happens during the sleep with mother baby with uh, the breast milk 
changing all the time to accommodate whatever it signals it's getting from the baby. And now we know, uh, you know, mothers don't want to give their morning milk to their babies at night because it's got wake up stuff in it. <laughs> time to be awake. <laughs> no, no, don't do that. You want the nighttime breast milk that you've expressed for the nighttime. So that it's just remarkable. And I just love him. I'm so grateful to him for all of his work. Uh, what else, what else, what other goodies do we have in there, Lisa? I would say the second edition, we did touch on adverse childhood experiences, oh. um, also known as ACEs, but we added more about pieces, positive childhood experiences, because we now know that, um, you know, we can experience adverse um situations in our life, but it can be balanced by the the relational buffers in our life and the positive experiences. So it's like a seesaw, right? The more positive can outweigh the negative experiences. And also what we know about ACEs is, is that it doesn't really account for, you know, it just says, did you experience any of these 10 things before the age of 18. But we know that, you know, a, a one-year-old or a two-year-old experiencing, you know, a traumatic situation is going to be, you know, have more of a reaction or more impact than a child who's 12 or 14. And it's the duration of time that the child goes through all of the nuances of, of these adverse experiences um, mm -hmm. can, you know, make or break a, a situation. Um, but again, the, it's the relational buffers. It doesn't have to be a parent. It could be one person, um, a coach, a teacher, um, a neighbor, an auntie, you know, just anyone who validates the child and, and makes them feel worthy and feel loved, which we've known for a long time, thanks to the work of Al Dr. Alice Miller, I, you know, she's deceased, but she was a uh, Swiss psychoanalyst um, who ended up writing many books um, about the, you know, the effects of culture on, on parenting and, you know, the child itself, drama, the gifted child. And For Your Own Good was a very powerful book for Barbara and me. Um, so we talk, we talk about that. And the other thing I'm excited about is um, the, the microbiome. We know so much more now about the microbiome. And now here we've been through this worldwide pandemic. And, you know, the focus now needs to be on building up children's immune systems the, to the best of our ability. And when um, mothers elect to have a C-section, um, they're doing a disservice to their child's immune system because now we know that the microbiome, the gut, is seeded by the mother during labor and during delivery. And then they call it seed and feed. So you're seeded during labor and then delivery, and then it's you feed the bacteria by you know having skin to skin contact, breastfeeding. And so there are ways, you know, we know that C sections are necessary, but it's the elective C sections that should be avoided. And those that have to have a C section can ask their daughter doctor to consider a vaginal swab, which is basically a roll of gauze that's inserted in the mother during labor. And then after delivery, they they wipe the baby's eyes, nose, and mouth with the, with the gauze, right? And then they put the baby skin to skin on the breast. So that'll help make up for the, the loss of bacteria. But just going through labor on its own is, it does a lot to, to uh, seed the, the infant's gut. And all the more reason for a mother to breastfeed if she's had a C-section. Is that Absolutely. colostrum that will really boost the, the baby's immune system. So even if she can only nurse in the hospital, <laughs> you know, uh, and that might be uh, something that she 
is successful with and wants to continue on with. Maybe she hadn't considered it before. But especially if it's an emergency C-section, uh, encouraging the mother to, to breastfeed is so important. Well, another challenge for mothers uh, is, again, Pitocin, uh, the drugs that they routinely give that are still being studied. We don't know the long-term effects, but that attaches to the oxytocin receptors. You need oxytocin to deliver, to go into labor, to have your deliver your baby, to have a successful breastfeeding relationship. And so if, um, if you're not able to, if you do have a, I love it when people try to call your <laughs> in an interview. Um, but, you know, if if more, more women knew what to expect when they go in into a hospital or dealing with the, you know, obstetrician, if they knew what questions to ask, if they knew what to avoid, they could circumvent so many issues. For instance, I have Pitocin with my first one. And breastfeeding was horrendous. I mean, it was horrible. And you see why women give up because they don't have that oxytocin, that natural oxytocin flow. So um, if you know that you're going to have a C-section, then, um, you know, give yourself some grace, right? Just know it's going to take me longer because it takes a while for the medications to get out of your system for the oxytocin the natural oxytocin to kick in, but women give up because they don't have the support. They don't have the information or support and, um, you know, and they're, and they're worn out. We get it. <laughs> I've been there. I understand, but it could have been avoided had I, had I known. Did you have something to add to that, Barbara? Um, no, but I do have one more thing I wanted to share that's new in our book that we talked uh, somewhat in the other um, versions about, you know, the importance of nature and uh, our worries about too much screen time, but we really give it a lot more um, emphasis because it has become so much more of a problem. I mean, little children now have have phones and you just see everybody on their phones all the time, even little, even toddlers, you know, are always on an iPad or something. And, you know, young parents, you know, depending on how young they are, that may have been part of their lives, their whole life. So if that, but for other parents, you know, maybe in their thirties or even their forties, they can look back on their childhood and remember you know, I didn't have these distractions. You know, what did I do? I can't even remember. Well, I probably went outside and played. And being in nature is so important. We know so much more about that, you know, for our, what they call earthing, you know, being on the earth, you know, children especially, but, you know, any, all of us, adults too, we need time breathing in, uh, with trees and being in nature is part of our physiology that we cannot deny. We cannot live isolated from nature for very long or, or we'll really pay the consequences physically, emotionally, spiritually. So <clears throat> we're again, it's consciousness raising it is really getting parents to understand about child development, about how the brain develops, how they children cannot learn language from a 2d screen language is about relationships so inter all those silly little interactions that we do and the peekaboo games and the babbling and and you know uh mirroring each other isn't just a silly game this is brain development it's so important be silly with your baby talk with that high-pitched voice get out in nature it's amazing how babies mentalities change if they're having a really fussy day and mother puts them in the front pack and goes out in the backyard or goes for a walk to the park and all of a sudden it's incredible the change and I think our babies are really hungry for nature they don't even know how to express it but you see it when they're 
experiencing it. You can feel so, it when you go outside. Yeah. You know, it's so I mean, calm. When you and we're outside. getting oxygenated. You know, that's uh, really incredibly simple, but incredibly profoundly important. So we uh, give parents a lot of resources for if they want to learn more about earthing or uh, what's called the nature vitamin, all of Richard Louv's work on helping children, you know, experiencing nature more. How easy it can be that we fall into everybody on their screens. We're not even eating meals together. So that um, I think is a profound change in our culture that the more we're aware, the more we empower each other, I know of families that, you know, they talk to the other families and they get their families of their friends or their children's friends to agree, you know, what kind of social media they're going to allow or not allow. So much of it is peer pressure. So if you can get the families of your closest children's friends to have some agreement about that, it's it can be a game changer in the lives of the children. We know bullying is a huge problem. Social media is something that has to be dealt with in a very conscious way. So um, that's why you need to find your tribe. Find your tribe. Find your tribe. Yes, find your tribe. I was thinking about, yeah, you know, I found my tribe and I got back up for uh, making the choices that I've made as a mother. But, you know, my son got uh, the nurturing normalized for him because he saw babies being tenderly cared for and toddlers and other children being spoken to respectfully. And it was an immersion that we were so lucky and grateful to have for those first early years of his life that we did have community that we could go to and have those experiences. And I do wish... Um, Everyone could have that for their children uh, in the beginning, at least what, three years, three years. That's all we need. Uh, so I know you're educators and, and we're at the top of our hour now. And I, um, I really wanted to hear the plan because I know Attachment Parenting International has a plan for parents and I want parents to feel supported and feel whatever, everything that is waiting for them there. It's not just the book. You do have groups and both of you are traveling the world uh, teaching classes. So how is how is that going and, and what's happening over there at API? Okay. You well, want we, me to let, me, let me say, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <clears throat> yes, we still have attachment parenting groups. I mean, they used to be affiliated with us, but they're independent now. However, we we do do have a path, um, a pathway through our organization where you can become a, accredited as a leader for your community and hold support groups, whether in person or online. But we know that we knew that parents wanted to learn more. You know, it's it's very comforting to be in a group of parents. And we're talking about dads too. I mean, over the years, we've had many dads who've been uh, support group leaders or moms and dads. So that was always just so um, fulfilling for us to see that. And we still have a, a dad in, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, who is a API group leader and an engineer. So you don't, you know, um, so we we had that network and you know we just felt like we could create a curriculum from our book because there's so much in there and people needed time to kind of you know digest it and to to practice it and process it and all that so oh my gosh since 2010 we've been working on the curriculum and then over the pandemic was the perfect opportunity for us to fine tune and improve the curriculum and since the fall of what 2021 I guess we we've done trainings in Greece and three trainings in Turkey and um, we have an independent lead trainer in Turkey now so she's you know she's going gangbusters over there and it's not just parents these what we're doing is training 
professionals to take this curriculum into their community and teach it to their parents. And they might be social workers, they might be psychologists, they might not teach the classes, but they incorporate the information in, um, you know, with their, their client. Um, they see, I think the reason it's so appealing to psychologists and social workers is they deal with the damage every day. They see the devastating effects of, you know, that lack of attachment, which is, you know, a worldwide problem, even though, you know, other countries are better at supporting uh, families, mothers, fathers, and children. Um, there's still some missing links there, you know, in terms of attachment. It, and it's cultural, you know, it's passed down from from generation to generation, as it is here, but goes much deeper in Greece and Turkey, right? We're talking thousands of years as opposed to hundreds of years here in the United States. So we're real, um, really uplifted by the interest in in our classes. And, uh, you know, we're, we're planning our, our trainings for next year, or we've already planned for this year. We're beginning to plan for next year. I want to mention Argentina also. We were in Buenos Aires and did a training there. And our Buenos Aires uh, trainer, she's in training to be a trainer, is spearheading our book being translated into Spanish. So we're hoping by next year, maybe the end of next year, we'll have a Spanish translation also. And that's a whole new world of uh, parents. And one thing that I was always moved by something Florencia told us, and I've heard this, we've heard this from other uh, trainers internationally is that, yes, our culture seems to be more about nurturing, more about touch, more about um, all the behaviors that we speak of in the eight principles, but yet that influence from the West is so strong. A lot of our professionals get trained in the United States or in other European countries, and they come back with ideas that are very foreign to our culture. So we're trying to empower parents to think for themselves. You know, their medical profession professional may have a different opinion. So let's not change what's strong in our culture. Let's keep it. And they're, they were relieved to see that um, we're Americans, but we're, <laughs> we're talking about, you know, some of these old traditional parenting techniques. Robin Grill said years ago that he had watched uh, the science come out of America and then not come back here as public policy and would go to other countries. Uh, so we have had the science in spades for a while. So it's so nice to have the two of you out there as ambassadors for that fact. Thank you very much. Um, and there is so much in your book and so much to learn as a parent. I, I don't want to... Um, I was just thinking, I felt like it was a graduate school program, everything that I needed to learn. And wouldn't it be great as a country if we could just start a little sooner with undoing some of the mythology uh, around Absolutely. parenting and the taboo, even talking about parenting, uh, so we can help prepare that next generation for what's coming and just how wonderful it is. Just it, it is glorious and wondrous to it was the best part of my whole life being a mother, but it wouldn't have been if I didn't have you too. So thank you so much. <laughs> and, uh, if we we're each paying, other, we're, okay. paying, we're paying it forward, you yeah. know. So much of the information we're sharing is information that we glean through many conferences we've been to, through La Leche League especially. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, nonviolent communication, you know, the work of Marshall Rosenberg, you know, and of course the attachment researchers, you know, it's just um, been a joy to feel like we're, we're paying forward all the gifts we've been given. Thank you. So, and you're doing the same thing, Lisa, with Kindred Media. All you're doing is fantastic. We're still here. Uh, I'll say that. And uh, so I'll let everyone know that Darsha's forward to the Attached to the Heart is on Kindred. Um, and then you can also go to the attached at the heart .com, uh, website and find more information there and attachment parenting 
.com org. So, and is there anything else that you'd like to share before we go? No. Oh, well, we could talk for hours, but thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. We're going through some, you know, trying times for parents, but there is hope. And there are people out there that can support you and guide you and help you navigate the rocky road of parenting, at least in our country, you know, and, um, you know, you can, you can uh, make decisions for your family. You don't have to follow uh, what the status quo is. There are many options out there. You just need to, to look for them and they'll, they'll find you. Follow your heart. Attached to the rock, right? <laughs> Thank you both so much. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Lisa.